you, Jeff, for um, all the songs. Man, those are great today. You know, I love singing about God's goodness and all the good things he's done, and it fits really well with what we're talking about, because today we're going to be talking specifically about what our response might be to the amazing gift that God has given us. And um, it's a pretty good gift. Sometimes we need a little bit of a reminder of of this gift uh, I don't know how many of you have ever just gotten an unexpected gift um, you know it's kind of cool whenever you know somebody's thinking about you or whenever you get a gift that may even just be really extravagant uh, a, a while back a friend of mine gave me this I gotta get my clicker out he gave me this uh, gold hoverboard whenever the hoverboards were brand new he just he just gave it to me which is really cool you know but he had one stipulation and that was that I ride it down the center aisle of the church I was preaching at and you know ride it up the side little ramps and preach from it um, I, I didn't do that of course not that I couldn't have because I could ride it pretty well uh, but it was steep and you know it would be embarrassing if I fell on my face in front of people and so I decided not to but I did write it a lot and and so did my family and so did my neighbors and so did the church staff uh, that I was working at with at the time we even wrote it around the church in the auditorium and Shelly even fell once or twice because she decided to to write it in high heels don't I don't know why but we don't have video of that you did yeah but it's funny because the only way that I could really express gratitude was to actually just enjoy it to live and ride this thing and so that's what we did and man we have got some stories that came from that and and it still runs it's something that I still you know well I haven't done it in a while but Liam rides it a lot now which is pretty good but the question we're going to be asking today is how do you respond to an exciting, good, gracious, extravagant, generous gift? How, how do you respond to that? And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But first I wanted to remind us of what it is this gift really is all about. I think if we remind ourselves of how good and amazing the gift is, then maybe we'll understand just how it is we should respond so let's uh let's uh, start off in prayer today we're going to be in romans chapter four through six so if you want to go and turn there at some point that's where we're going to be there's bibles in the pew pockets right in front of you let's pray together <clears throat> heavenly father we are so thankful for today lord you are good you have done great things for us you still do great things even in the midst of of our mistakes even in the midst of a crazy and unpredictable world, Lord, you are good. Lord, we continue to lift up our friends, Lord, in, in uh, Ukraine. Lord, we lift up the Ukrainian people. We lift up the Russian people. We lift up all of those in the neighboring countries who are now suddenly um, hosts, being hospitable to people. Lord, giving of their time and effort to show grace and mercy. To, to refugees Lord we lift up our own country Lord we have problems of our own people can't seem to agree and even when we do simply express an opinion we get blasted for it Lord for some reason we just can't get along Lord, Lord but we know that you're good and we know that in the midst of those difficulties in our own nation you are finding ways to bring light and joy and hope to people Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve our neighbors here in San Angelo. There's so many people that need to be served, that need to know what it means, what it feels like to be loved. Thanks for that opportunity. Thanks for this church and the heart that you've given them, Lord, to serve and to love. Lord, help us to do more. Help us to be people who are so thankful for the gifts that you've given us that we can do nothing but live and enjoy and share this with other people in jesus name amen all right so we're in romans chapter four through six um we're spending time in paul's letter to the romans and i hope that you're taking time to read it as well and i'm going to encourage you just take some time to read through some of these verses not not verse by verse but just take a chapter at a time 
and it doesn't really take a lot of time to read it especially if you break it up but just work your way through it and what I've learned is when you decide to dwell in a particular text for a while you kind of start to see things in a little different way um, for some of you Romans reading it may be a first for some of you it may be something that's very familiar to you but I know that even in the most familiar of places we can see new things and that's what I hope you're finding through this series so I'm going to uh, encourage you to continue to spend some time in Romans and when in Rome hopefully you'll find some things that may be familiar along with some things that might be new to you as well now believe it or not Romans didn't get a lot of attention for for a while in the religious world even though it was canonized it didn't get a whole lot of attention until the, well there was a guy named Augustine who uh, read through it he kind of made some commentaries and and you know decided on some pretty s significant things through Romans but it really wasn't uh, until Martin Luther this priest uh, he found it I mean, it's not that it was lost but he really started diving in to Romans and and after him it kind of became this dominant letter of the New Testament in a world of strict rules and regulations in the Catholic Church this particular letter addressed some of Luther's pivotal questions that he was trying to work through and Luther I think is the one who's kind of helped shape our view of what Romans is you know he read it in Latin and the thing that really scared him was the justice of God because he knew that there was nothing he could ever do that would be good enough to satisfy the justice of God but he did find this this um, peace and liberation in chapter 1 verse 17 we've been reading this this is kind of an anchor text for us for in it the gospel is what we're talking about for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith as it is written the one who is righteous will live by faith so Luther uh, was tormented by this idea that salvation had to be earned because in his culture there was a lot of work that one needed to do to earn and maintain even salvation in fact he saw the catholic church as the judaizers that paul talks so often about in scripture you know and his research as he's kind of working through it led him to galatians you know, led Martin Luther to Galatians 2, where Paul says this. He says, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith. And remember, this is that phrase, we, you know, it could, it's of or in from uh, by justified by faith in or of Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law so Luther takes this to mean that we are we are saved by faith not by the things that we do which le leads us to this idea of something I mentioned last week is that our salvation has a lot more to do with God than it has to do with us and what strikes me most about this line of thought is that salvation is purely a gift of God. It is a gift from God that is rooted in His kindness. What does it say a few chapters earlier? Well, I've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks. God's kindness was always meant to lead us to repentance. God is kind and it's rooted in his kindness now for many of us who've been kind of born maybe born into church we've been um, educated we've sat in the pew a lot in our life if I, was, I wasn't born in church but man I got there as fast as I could you know and I spent a lot of time in church and I think for some of, for some of us we may see this gift of God as something that is really only able to not only it's something that we're really going to experience after we die you know once we die then the gift of God really kicks in it's like like a long-term investment almost there was a guy that I knew you know he says oh yeah giving Christianity it's kind of like an insurance policy okay it's one way I guess to look at it 
Some of us, we look at God's gift, the gift of eternal life as something that happens after we die. It's kind of like that long-term investment. And because of that, we've kind of become desensitized a bit to what an amazing gift this really is for here and now. This is salvation. This gift, it is, it is being seen as righteous in the eyes of God. I mean, God is righteousness. And this gift is, is allowing him to see us as righteous. It's a miracle. Because you know what you've done. Nobody else may know all of it, but you, do, you know, so couldn't ima- you know, just imagine, if you believe and the Spirit is in you, God sees you as righteous. Wow. I mean, Paul refers to Abraham in uh, chapter 4. Of, of Romans in verse 3 and it says specifically Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous and he's referring of course to the story in Genesis 15 where God tells Abraham hey you're going to have a son you're going to have kids as numerous as the stars he's old Sarah's old but you know what Abraham believed he believed and so God gave him righteousness. He says, wow, you believe that? Okay, God's going to credit it to him as righteous. Even though he wasn't perfect by any stretch. We know Abraham tended to lie. We know he tended to do some things that, ne- that weren't necessarily perfect. And all this happened before Abraham got this outward mark of what it means to be Jewish. You know, there was an outward sign um, of being a member of the Hebrew community if you were a man that's that circumcision and, and that sign became more of the symbol of what it means to be a follower of God that's what people kind of you know focused on was oh yeah this is my outward mark now I'm a true Israelite a true Hebrew so this is what Paul says about God's righteousness he says it isn't for those simply who bear the mark he says this in Romans 4 11 and 12 circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised so Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised that's the Gentile world right they are counted as righteous because of their faith and Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised Abraham simply believed fully I mean could it be that simple I know it doesn't make sense to those of us who still think we need to do something to kind of continually earn our place or maintain it with God. But what if it's true? It's about believing with everything you are. It's believing that God is telling the truth. Paul says this in Romans 4, 24 and 25. God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification do you believe this? and did you know there's nothing at all we ever did to earn any of this? nothing God didn't wait till we had our lives right before he offered us the gift I mean, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. In fact, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I know it's sometimes difficult to kind of put this into perspective because we may be a bit desensitized. I mean, if you own a Bentley, it's a pretty cool thing. If you're driving your Bentley to Tom Thumb, or to, which is what we saw in Dallas, Shelly's like, if you have to drive your Bentley to Tom Thumb, something's wrong. You may be a little desensitized to how cool this car is. It's not a Tom Thumb car, guys. Right? I think sometimes we, 
we may be desensitized to how amazing this gift actually is. And what this means is that each and every one of you matter. What this gift means is that you're not an afterthought. You weren't a, oh yeah, I forgot you were born. Yeah, sure, you're, come on in. No, you are not an afterthought. No matter how many mistakes you made, how many you are still making, you are unbelievably valuable to God. And what's so great is God wants you to actually be a part of his family. He wants you to live with him forever. He's opening up a space for you. In fact, he's creating one specifically for you. He wants you to be a part of his family. He wants you. He wants you as a group. He wants you as individuals to be a part of his family, which means that you can be forgiven for everything you've ever done. You can have a brand new start, a brand new life, a good future, hope. The question I'm asking is, how are we going to respond to that? How do we, how have we responded to this gift? Sometimes the the gift is so great, we may not really know how to properly respond to it. You know, Paul talks about the importance of baptism, how this is a response. You know, it's a response that comes when we don't want to sin anymore. It's a response that comes when we we don't want, when we, we know we need something more. So in Paul's day, baptism was a given. It was a given. You know, if you believed, you got baptized. You know, it was a response that was rooted in love. It was a response rooted in joy and gratitude. And if you believed, then you repented. And then you were baptized. There really was no if. Like there is today. It wasn't wasn't an if back then. He says this. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And this is what's so great. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father we too may have a brand new life our old life it's gone if you haven't believed it could be your old life could be gone we don't have to do the same things that we used to do it's this gift of freedom You know, it's this uh, gift of a new way of seeing and moving and responding and living in the world. Sometimes um, as I'm going through, you know, the web and things, sometimes a story kind of strikes strikes me as, you know, representative of this type of of joy and gratitude. And, And, you know, what an unexpected and extravagant gift can do for a person a few years ago there was a 13 year old boy who had cere- who has cerebral palsy and he uh, was given a gift that was completely unexpected and I wanted you to see the moment that he sees this for the very first time and kind of hear a little bit more about this story so so let's watch this for a minute are you serious that's yours buddy are you serious I'm serious what do you think you're kidding. I'm not. Get you are. Huh? Yes, you are. I'm not. It's an action track chair, a wheelchair that can go on just about any surface. Freedom like he's never had. So what's this up here? Fishing rod holder. At a year old, we, uh, uh, he was diagnosed with CP, uh, cerebral palsy, and uh, so he's quadriplegic. Uh, and so he's a normal little kid. It's just that his muscles just don't work uh, like yours and mine. His main mode of transportation is a power wheelchair, um, but it's heavy. It's quite a few hundred pounds. Uh, It'll sink down in grass. Uh, If it's uh, wet or slippery, uh, you know, ice or anything else like that, he's got to be really careful. The whole chair will slide. And to make this surprise even sweeter. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, Kanan. That's just someone being super nice, huh? Let's rewind to mid-March. The Neitzels were on vacation in Florida. And almost immediately, Kanan pointed out to this guy that was on the beach and said, look, there's a track chair. They introduced yeah. themselves, oh, and the man good. let Kanan try out his chair. <laughs> it was Kanan's first time on sand on his own. A few days later, Chris got a surprise of his own. And he pulled me to the side, and uh, he asked if, if we would let him do something special for Kanan because he saw the joy that that brought to him. Joy that a chance meeting has multiplied. He bought that for you. Do I have an email so I can send him a message? 
Uh, we can probably send him a text and say thanks. Look at that one. Oh my How god. How does that make you feel? Something good. Huh? Does it? Yeah. Does that make you excited? Awesome. Huh? Awesome. You don't know how to react, do you? No. I've never seen a donor um, change someone's life like this. It's Chad Hermanson sells thing. action track chairs and says he's never seen anything like this. No, not like this. We've had different organizations that have purchased chairs um, for people, but never, you know, a one single private donor surprising a family with a chair. Pretty cool. For him to be able to go and explore a whole new world is, is just amazing. It's so cool. A gift of a lifetime. It's kindness in motion. I love that story. So many things. The family did absolutely nothing to deserve that. It was just given to them. Even It was so generous that even the one giving them, like the middleman was overwhelmed. Like I've never seen anything like this before. And that was a gift that was to be experienced in the here and now. And it gave this boy freedom to see the world in a whole new way. His response was gratitude. It was overwhelmed. I mean, he was overwhelmed. It was, it was a response that he just said, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to live. I'm going to explore. It was joy. And I must confess in the past, I have not always responded to the gospel as, as joyfully as I know I should have. And for quite some time, I responded more out of a sense of obligation and fear than I did out of love and gratitude. You know, I'd be amazed at what God had done for me, but even though I knew it was a free gift, I was living as if there were still strings attached. Can't mess up. Can't do this. God's going to get upset. My response wasn't rooted in love. My response was rooted in obligation. And there's a difference. And I'm going to tell you, God's generosity will overwhelm our worst mistake. What does Paul tell us to do? He says, he says hey, don't, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. You know, you don't have to keep making the same mistakes. You respond to God. You don't have to see people as the enemy. This gift allows you to see things in a whole new way. You don't have to look down on people just because they don't make good choices. You know, you don't have to look down on people who think differently than you or people who, you know, don't do things you agree with or have highly visible sins. You don't have to look down on them like we used to. We don't have to worry about, you know, trying to be better than other people that's not going to get us anywhere self-centeredness is what we don't have to worry about anymore because we've died with Christ so now we live a whole new life now the spirit is in us we don't have to earn anyone else's favor because we have God's favor he completely and absolutely adores us Paul was given this gift and he believed and he responded with love and so you don't hear Paul talk about how hard we need to work to earn God's love. You don't hear, hear Paul talk about how we need to ensure that everything is just perfect and just so, you know, or else. No, God's gift, his gospel comes baked in grace. So Paul encourages us to respond in love. He tells us to offer ourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. You know, he says, sin shall not be your master. And then he says, the wages of sin is death. He says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life, it's not, it's not just a gift that comes after we die. Eternity, believe it or not, starts right now. Right now. You believe? I mean, this life, this eternal life, is avail it's, it's available for you here and now. It's a gift that is rooted in love for you and kindness for you. So why don't we root our response to God in love, in gratitude, in joy? 
mean, let's get busy living, right? Let's enjoy the creation that God's given us. Let's enjoy the people he's entrusted to us, even the ones that annoy us. Let's enjoy them. Let's enjoy the ability to work and to speak and to walk and to move. And let's enjoy the, the ability to give freely, knowing that God's going to provide for us whatever we may not think we have. Let's enjoy and, and be thankful for the emotions God's given us, as wild as they may be. Let's be thankful for the, for the highs and thankful for the sadness and the happiness and the lows. What if we chose to see our difficulties as a way to become closer to God and to understand other people better? You know, we don't have to be bound now to what other people think about us. We don't have to condemn others who aren't as far along as we are. We can root ourselves in the knowledge that God absolutely loves us. He absolutely loves you. He adores you. And he has brought you, at least he's offering, to bring you from death to life forever. And a whole new way of seeing here and now so you can actually begin living fully. And I'm going to say, if you have yet to believe, why? Why? I mean, you can't blame it on the choices of others. You know, don't say, I'm not believing because people who claim to be Christians aren't acting right. Remember, that's the whole reason God's done what he's done because none of us are acting right. And that, spoiler alert, you're not either. If you think that, there's, you, we can't. We can't act the way we're supposed to fully without God. It's the reason God has done this. None of us can save ourselves. We can't even show love consistently. Which is why God's offering you a free gift for eternity and for the here and now. And it is a good gift. And if you do believe, how are you responding to this new life? Are you responding with gratitude, with joy, with love, excitement, awe, wonder? Or are we living in obligation with so much pressure? No one was meant to carry that much pressure. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. God, Jesus, has done the, the heavy work for you. Can you believe? How will you respond? Because every choice is a response. As the praise team comes up, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to pray this morning with some men and women that are going to be around the room. And I'm going to offer you an opportunity if you want to, if you want to respond right now. If you're like, you know what, I put it off too much, I'm, I'm ready. The water's ready, and it's even warm. It's a lot warmer than the room. <laughs> right? I'm sorry I had to say it. But I'll tell you this, none of you fell asleep today, amen? <laughs> Mitch, I think we got a plan from here on out. It's time. If you're on the fence, it's time, y'all. Let's get busy living. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us. And I pray that those people this, this morning who have been living in the sense of obligation and fear, Lord, help them right now to release that and begin a whole new way of seeing too through love and excitement and gratitude there's nothing we'll ever be able to do to repay the gift you've given us so help us Lord to simply live and share the stories Lord those people who are on the fence right now I pray Lord that you would help them to just make a choice to choose well because today's the day in Jesus name amen let's stand together if you need prayer we'll be around the room